Today we're happy to have Jackson Fisk from. Cool. Today we're happy to have Jackson Fisk from Cambridge to tell us about higher dimensional bulk age correspondence and topological entanglement. Great. Um, thank you, and thank you all to uh, being here. I'm very excited to uh, talk here and. Very excited to share some research um, that is, was done in collaboration with a very talented PhD student uh, who's currently in Amsterdam and will be moving to Brussels in September. Um, I mean, wrote a couple of papers at mid and late last year about topological uh, quantum field theories and higher dimensions and exploring various aspects of these and um, in particular various entanglement aspects of these theories. Um, and I wanted to share with you today a sort of nice story involving a, a bulk edge correspondence that exists in these theories and what how this bulk edge correspondence interplays with topological entanglement entropy. So um, I'll begin with some motivation and some context, which I'll actually keep quite short because it's given the I know the crowd um, here. But um, maybe it's useful to think uh, in two plus one D where the notion of topological entanglement entropy has uh, been very well fleshed out. Um, and there, really, we know that long-range entanglement is a sort of smoking gun signal of topological order, and this can be diagnosable right at the level of the wave function. We don't necessarily need to solve uh, the Hamiltonian and look at spectrum. And this is, say, a useful tool for looking at uh, uh, wave functions that you might try to solve variationally and see if they, in fact, have top if they describe topological order. And sort of the Central result in here is the Levin-Wynn kataev preskill topological entanglement entropy, which is a statement that um, in 2 plus 1 D for gap systems, we'll have a leading term in entanglement entropy, which scales like the perimeter of a system size. And then there could be a constant subleading correction. And at least on the surface levels, this correction is independent of um, any regularization scheme, any lattice scales, and the scale of the system, and so it has a hope of being universal, and indeed uh, encodes some universal aspects of the anion spectrum of these theories. And so this was coined the topological entanglement entropy. Um, in 2 plus 1D, it's also uh, nice to describe these theories using IR effective field theories, and these are 3D topological quantum field theories, um, Chern Simons theories. And the nice things about these topological quantum field theories is they give us a lot of tools, a lot of powerful tools for um, exploring uh, various aspects of entanglement entropies. And one tool that we very much like from these topological quantum field theories is what's called a bulk edge correspondence. Um, and this comes in several different flavors or several different aspects. Um, for one, uh, this bulk edge correspondence uh, kind of follows from the notion of, of anomaly inflow. Um, where the anomaly on the boundary of a system uh, can, be, can be compensated by a uh, corresponding anomaly in a higher dimensional uh, topological quantum field theory. But then also there's, um, for the purposes of this talk, uh, a matching of spectrums, a matching of the bulk entanglement spectrum with the spectrum of edge, edge uh, excitations. And the spectrum is not just some random spectrum, it's actually organized by an infinite dimensional uh, symmetry algebra, which goes by the name of katz moody algebra. And this infinite dimensionality of a, of a symmetry algebra in 2D um, also calls forth ideas of conformality. And indeed, these two things are, are linked together. In fact, these, these guys are 2D CFTs, and this follows directly from, say, a Sugawara construction um, of the stress tensor from this katz moody algebra. What do you mean by infinite dimensional? That you have the infinitely many modes or infinitely many currents? Infinitely many currents. And the corresponding representations of these guys will also be infinite dimensional. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, good. So now uh, we can ask what aspects of this uh, continue to hold in higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, um, things are just generally more interesting. Topological order itself is more interesting. Uh, there are different notions of topological order. Um, for instance, we have where so-called multipole insulators, where you can have gapless modes isolated, not necessarily on the edge of a system, but let's say hinges and corners of, of a system. We now know there's a, 
that there are um, certain fracton type systems, and this has been an area of research that has very much been heating up, um, which have very unusual and interesting features like uh, excitations with locked mobility, um, extensive ground state degeneracies, very intricate and interesting UV IR mixing. But even more mundanely talking about topological quantum field theories, the standard topological quantum field theories, um, these field theories can themselves be more interesting. We can start to uh, involve higher form fields. And also with more dimensions, we can write down say more marginal interactions um, that intertwine these fields and give interesting winding statistics to the excitations. And of course, as we increase in dimension, topology itself has the room to become more interesting. So if we go up in dimension, we can ask what about the bulk edge correspondence that we're familiar with in 2 plus 1D. And of course, we always have a notion of anomaly inflow that continues to hold in higher dimensions, um, where again, the edge of a system's anomalies can be encoded in a higher dimensional topological quantum field theory. And this notion has also been extended um, in the past year to talk about organizing a system's global symmetries and the global uh, forms of those global symmetries through what's called a symmetry TFT. Um, but for the questions of entanglement, we want to know how much does this structure buy us? Um, for instance, in 2D, we had an infinite dimensional current algebra and this current algebra was tied to the conformality of that 2D CFT. Um, but in higher dimensions, the conformal algebra is no longer infinite dimensional. So we might worry that in fact, a bulk edge correspondence would not be powerful enough to say fix the entire spectrum of an edge mode theory. So um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on a class of topological quantum field theories and their corresponding bulk edge correspondences. And these guys will exist in all dimensions. And in these topological quantum field theories, in fact, the edge spectrum is organized by an infinite dimensional higher form current algebra um, that arises from bulk gauge transformations that don't die off at the boundary. And this current algebra is infinite dimensional and exists, but even though the boundary theory is not a conformal field theory in general. Um, but the power of this uh, symmetry algebra is it'll completely fix the entanglement tree of the bulk. And in particular, it'll give us all the things that we normally um, Suspect, expect area laws and subleading area laws, but then they'll often give us universal subleading terms with topological coefficients that we can regard as the higher dimensional versions of a topological entanglement entry. Okay. So I will begin by describing the theories I have in mind. So these guys are abelian EF theories, um, and I'll be working in, in arbitrary D dimensions. Here D is D minus one plus one, if uh, that's, that's the convention I'm using here. So this is space and time. And the action is of the following form. We have uh, B, which A, A is a P form, and B is a D minus P minus one form. And I've inserted here a integral K matrix, although this guy will mostly just uh, play a spectator role. We can just, in general, just write down a level. Um, but I've written it here just because I can. And the first thing we'll note about this theory is that it is indeed topological. Um, we can perform its path integral carefully, um, accounting for both gauge redundancies and uh, over redundancies of, this, of these gauge redundancies. And what we'll find is that this path integral is proportional to what's called the racing or torsion of the manifold that it's on. Um, and then also we can pull out um, its dependence on the K matrix, which uh, was something that we had to sort of laboriously do in this paper uh, because we were very interested in how the entanglement entropy will scale with K. Um, and the powers of this K matrix involve an Euler character of the manifold with an arbitrary coefficient, which comes from ambiguities and regularize, regularizing this measure, and then something that is the sum of Betty numbers. So everything here is going to be topological. Uh, another nice aspect of these theories is that they have finite um, but generally uh, greater than one, um, and topologically robust ground state degeneracies. So if I quantize this theory on a spatial slice, compact spatial slice, then it depends upon K with some power that is a Betty number. And we can give a nice interpretation to the states that span this Hilbert space by say, looking at the gauge invariant operators, which are surface operators, which generalize the notion of Wilson lines 
in higher dimensions, where we take a field and we integrate it along a homology cycle living on our spatial slice. And then we can start building the states of the system um, by acting, say, for instance, P, P form surface operators um, acting on a complementary surface form condensate. So this condensate is one such that all of these acting on it fall into it and just give back the same state. And then when we act with the Ws onto that state, we can generate the rest of the, the rest of these ground states. And so um, these guys really are uh, the analog of the string net condensates in 2 plus 1D, um, and you might call these uh, higher form surface net condensates. So these are the states of the system. Okay, so maybe I'll pause to see if there are any questions so far before we go on to what this theory looks like when we put it on manifold boundary. Yes. So the the ambiguity in the exponent of that k, but is is that like something like a framing anomaly? Like what is the? No, because it's not necessarily a phase. Um, what it is is uh, it it comes into how you regularize, say the. Um, the, how should I say, the, the large gauge sector, the flux sector of this measure. Um, and there's just a choice that you have to make in, in, how, in, what, in defining this measure. And you, and you see that different choices basically give you, differ by an other characteristic here. So it's part of the definition of your infinite. Exactly, yeah. I guess to rephrase my question, where does alpha live? Where does alpha, alpha is a real number. It's real value. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's a, that's actually yeah good that's a good point um, but yes alpha is real valued and it's again is is just defining properly this uh, this path integral measure and there's different choices but they all differ by an Euler characteristic yeah do you have to consider a general k matrix can't you somehow make that diagonal or something I mean in this case you probably can yes um, and but I'm not used I'm just not used to seeing that. Um, higher dimensional K matrix. I'm just wondering, is that necessary or is it? It's not necessary whatsoever. Uh, yeah, we, we thought it might, we thought we might have some interesting things that pop out from this, but then it all ended up being determinants anyways, so, but I just pretty much pulled the formulas from the paper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in, in general, you can just, yeah, you can think about this as a, a bunch of diagonal inner. Well, okay, we, we, we should be a little bit careful. It, this guy should be integral as a matrix, so the, the, the diagonalized guy might be fractional. Um, but if you're willing to live with fractional um, levels, then, then that, that will work. Okay, good. So um, we will note that this theory has an obvious gauge redundancy where we take things by uh, we ship things by closed forms um, of one lower degree. And as we're familiar from Chern Simons theories, when our manifold possesses a boundary, um, this transformation can actually change the action. And so the way I, I prefer to say this is that um, this symmetry globalizes. It's, it no longer is a gauge redundancy, but is a global symmetry that actually acts on the states of a system with boundary. And indeed, we can write down charges that are associated to these variational um, transformations, and these guys will generate uh, the different, or generate the action on the states. Um, and so, for instance, for the alpha transformations, it is given by wedging it with B, and for the beta transformations, it's given uh, wedging with A. There's a slight um, subtlety that in order for these guys to actually be non-zero, because these guys um, possess themselves some redundancy, in order for to have non-zero charges, the only guys that survive are the ones that obey a transversality condition. So these are transversal gauge transformations. Um, and using the standard uh, canonical commutation relations of A and B, we can write down charge algebra, and they uh, exhibit um, a central term here. Okay. So we would like to use this algebra um, to some degree to, to see what, what it, can it actually buy us. So it's useful to actually process it in a, in a nice form um, by say putting, using a mode expansion. And we need to specify what are nice modes to actually deal with. And a nice set of modes are eigenforms of the transversal Laplacian. So we have one for P four P minus one forms, I'll call bar phi. And we have one for D minus P minus two forms, that I'll call chi. And it turns out that the spectrum of these modes 
um, are the exact same set, uh, or actually the non-zero spectrum is the exact same set. Um, this is just guaranteed by point Poincaré duality on the boundary of our spatial slice. Yes. Um, because, I mean, the Laplacian well, depends on the metric. Yes, it does. It seems like a strange thing to do in a topological theory to introduce metrics. Um, that is that is true, but this is uh, something that um, we will have to just live with because it, so um, why is this? Um, indeed, this this guy will depend upon a metric. Um, I guess I would say it's also the same in two plus one D. Um, there it's a little bit hidden because we would think that we can always do any mode expansion, but there's in principle that mode expansion uh, also depends upon a length scale inside the, or what, yeah, it depends on how we're normalizing the angular coordinate on say an S1. Um, I, yeah, there's going to be, other instances where a metric on the boundary is going to be employed. And ultimately this comes down to regularizing um, what happens there. And so when we evaluate the entanglement entropy, we're going to have to have um, like a length scale that will absorb UV divergences. But then there'll be subleading pieces at the end that are indeed um, dependent only on the topology. But you're right, this this guy, these spectral parameters or these, these eigenvalues do depend upon a metric. And that is going to be an important part of the story. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Could it be that states on the edge depends on the metric on the edge, not bulk, but edge? Yes, that's right. Uh, well, sorry. Um, Probably not. Let me, let, me, let me back up. So this guy here is, is a current algebra that, is, uh, that does not depend upon any metric, right? What we're doing is we are just employing a metric to have a nice mode expansion of this current algebra. And so whether or not the Hilbert space of this theory really, the, the edge theory actually depends upon that metric, I think is, I, I don't think it does, but um, we're going to need to construct it in a more palatable form than this. And in order to construct it in a more palatable form, I'm going to need to employ a metric. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, could it be that this issue about metric on the edge? Yes depends on the boundary conditions on the fields which you apply. Yes. You may do one way or another way. The result could be depend on the metrics or may not depend on the metrics. Yes, good. Whether, whether you choose boundary condition properly and uh, it is true. No, this, this is true. This is true. Um, right now we're, we're allowing boundary conditions where everything fluctuates on the boundary. And this is what allows um, us to write down these, these charges. Um, obviously, there's a very, there's a very, like, there's a very obvious boundary condition you write in BF3 where you just set either B or A to zero on the boundary. And this is variationally consistent with the action as it's written. Um, this is more akin to like a gap boundary condition, and this will obviously kill half the charges, and the other charges just, um, I assume, have to also vanish in some other way. Um, and it is, and you're also correct in saying that when I, if I impose boundary conditions, what I call global symmetries depends upon what preserves those boundary conditions, right? Uh, um, so, may I reformulate the question, but I yeah. sh shut up. Uh, uh, could it be that boundary depends maybe not on the metric, but on the curvature of the boundary? Ooh. Um, like the extrinsic curvature? It, I, because it's embedded in the, yes. in the bulk. Right. Yes. Um, I will, okay, good. That's 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 a good question. I don't know if I can exactly answer that right now. I am, but I, when we get when we get to the the final answer for the entanglement entropy, it is indeed true that the things that will be geometric will be integrated quantities of heat kernel coefficients, and these guys are things like you say, like extrinsic curvatures, and um, yeah, both extrinsic and extrinsic curvatures as well. So I think you might be onto something, but I, I can't say for sure. Um, but I do want to reemphasize the, 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 the previous point that, yes, this also depends upon um, some boundary conditions. And I will be more explicit with those boundary conditions when I write down the edge mode theory. Yeah. Right now, I'm just allowing everything to fluctuate on the boundary. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, good. 
I will, yes, I will do this. I will allow this mode expansion and then I'll, I'll integrate my, my fields along this, uh, along these modes to write down some currents. And these currents are indexed by the same set, um, be it point career duality. And there are also some um, zero modes of this algebra, which are given by harmonic forms on uh, the boundary of our spatial slice. And so I'll also integrate these guys along uh, these harmonic forms to write these zero modes. It's also a little bit useful for later to include what's called the Graham matrix here, um, which is just the inner product between um, these harmonic forms on partial sigma. But this is just a technicality. Okay. And since A and B are now indexed by the same set, um, we can use them to build raising and lowering operators and put the current algebra in a nice form where the commutator of a raising operator with a lowering operator is has a central term that goes like the square root of the spectral parameter. Um, and here, because uh, we're in general dimensions, these guys may not uh, may not enjoy this, this sort of uh, specialness of transcendence theory and having no length scales involved, we have to generally include an arbitrary length uh, energy scale with some um, dimension there. Um, but this should already look familiar to you if you're familiar if you're familiar with two plus one D Katz Moody algebras, because this also is very comparable to the U1 Katz Moody algebra. And in fact, we can do some relabeling of these guys and put it directly into the form that we are familiar with in you want Katz Moody algebras. So um, when I say that this guy is a raising operator and this guy is a lowering operator, um, I am implicitly saying uh, raising and lowering with respect to something. And indeed, we can add a Hamiltonian uh, for the to this guy, which is J times K plus maybe some constant piece here, such that um, K raises the eigenvalue of this H by the square root of of the eigenvalue or the, the Laplacian eigenvalue and J lowers it by the same amount. So now we have this nice algebra, um, which is infinite dimensional and seems to exist at the edge of all of these BF theories. Um, and the most natural thing we would want to do once you have the symmetry algebra is to construct its representations. And we can indeed do so in sort of the standard way. Uh, we start with some lowest weight states or what I'll call primary states. And these will be eigenvalues of the zero modes, and then also this oscillator Hamiltonian. And then we just start acting with the raising operators onto the slowest weight state. Okay, and so we'll just be this representation here. And we would like to now um, compute a character of this representation, but uh, we need to uh, regularize sort of the infinite amount of modes there. And again, this is also familiar to us from Katz Moody algebras, where we have an infinite amount of modes in order to correctly compute characters, we need to supplement it with the Hamiltonian. We've already done this for the oscillators, but we need to add something for the zero modes. And in principle, we could add anything we like, but the principle that I will go by here is that um, really, really want this to be a local quantity or a locally integrated quantity, such that if I add the zero mode Hamiltonian plus the oscillator Hamilton, oscillator Hamiltonian, it can be expressed in terms of something local in the fields. And so this completely fixes for us the zero mode Hamiltonian, um, and we can write this total Hamiltonian in the following quadratic form. Okay, and this guy will come back to us um, later on. Do you have something like null vectors? Uh, null vectors, uh, no, no, we do not. No. What was the algebra for the KNs obeyed again? Say again. What's the algebra of the KNs? Yeah, it's this algebra here. Where, where the calligraphic K is the K matrix in the original. Yeah, that's right. Actually. Yeah. Okay. I'm suppressing indices on these guys here and here. Um, if you like, we can now disregard K as just a, a constant and, and not think of it as a matrix. Yeah. Okay. So I think the zero mode, the way you're treating the zero modes is a choice of morally central extension or not so much here? Uh, not so much. Um, the central extension here is is already present in the oscillator spectrum, right? These guys, this is this is central already. Um, it's just that if we look at how these currents are or how these guys, this algebra appears, if um, this alpha or beta were to be uh, harmonic, then this guy would just 
be an automatically zero mode of this algebra. And so we have to pick some basis of these guys and we picked the, pick the judicious basis. Um, K with K is zero, J, J is zero. That's right. Okay, good. Um, so with this ha Hamiltonian in hand, we can now construct a character by tracing over our representation. Um, and we have a piece that will just be quadratic in the zero modes. Um, I will not write down its full form, but what's important to us is that it's quadratic in the A zeros and B zeros. And then we have this guy here, which comes from summing up all the descendants. And this guy I've written in a particular way because I want to um, draw attention to its uh, similarities to the Didikin eta function. But instead of just a single mode sitting here, um, it's in fact the square root of, of, of a spectral, or the square root of the, the spectrum of the Laplacian. And so we'll call this guy a spectral eta function. Um, we'll define it this way. Um, it will also be nice for us to define what are called extended characters, also something that we like to do with cats and algebras by summing over all um, the modules of this guy. And doing so, because this is quadratic in A0 and B0, we'll resum these into uh, Jacobi theta functions. Okay, so um, pausing for a second and taking stock of what we have so far, um, we have we were able to construct these representations of our infinite dimensional algebra, and the extended characters take the form of theta over eta, which is completely analogous to the extended characters of U1 Katz Moody algebras. Um, as was mentioned or maybe uh, emphasized earlier, um, this these characters do know about the geometry, not just the topology of our boundary manifold. Um, and this geometry enters through the spectrum of the transverse Laplacian. Um, and this is going to be encoded in, uh, for us in this spectral eta function here. However, there's a piece that knows about the topology of this guy, of this guy because it's going to depend upon the fluxes of A and B. And this is going to enter into the Jacobi theta function here. I want to call upon also one more piece of um, intuition from 2 plus 1D, which is that um, U1 Katz Moody algebras and their representations also play a role as the Hilbert spaces of the chiral compact boson. And this um, in particular implies, let's say, the thermal partition function of this theory ends up taking the form of an extended character. And of course, this is one of the aspects of the bulk edge correspondence in 2 plus 1D. And so now what I want to um, transition to here is the corresponding statement in uh, higher dimensions. What is, what is the theory uh, here whose thermal partition function gives us an extended character and whose Hilbert space is organized by this algebra and its representations? Okay, so this is now the edge mode theory. Um, so we'll return back to the path integral and we will put this, uh, theory on a manifold's boundary, such that its boundary takes the form of a thermal circle times another manifold. And in order to do so, we need to um, supply boundary conditions and also to make those boundary conditions uh, variationally well posed, um, su supply them with the boundary action. And what I'll focus on here are quadratic boundary actions. Since uh, in generic dimensions, um, generic space-time dimensions, uh, these quadratic actions will have some length scale, and so we'll, there'll be a, mo a most relevant quadratic term. And for just the sake of this talk, let's suppose that that most relevant term is the a which star a term. So we'll write this down as the as our boundary action. And taking the variational principle, we see that this is variationally consistent with imposing what I'll call chiral-like boundary condition, where I relate um, b to the Hodge star of A on the boundary. Um, and so this is a this is a boundary condition that relates forms of different degrees. Um, and I would call it a chiral-like boundary condition because in Chern Simons theories, when we, when we add the same action for the Chern Simons field, the corresponding boundary condition is uh, one plus Hodge star A is zero, or in complex coordinates that A Z is zero. And this is exactly the boundary condition that we would write down to give rise to, say, the chiral boson. And so here, we've generalized this to act on p forms and, um, and on high, and d minus p minus 1 forms. I'll mention that we are definitely not the first people to notice this boundary condition or write it down or even explain 
how it gives rise to edge mode theory. I do think that as far as I can tell that we were the first to really carefully quantitize this edge mode theory and think about what this boundary condition implies for this, this theory. Are you, are you seeing anything about the metric on, on the boundary of sigma? We've, we've, we have supplied the, the boundary of sigma with the metric in, implicitly in writing down this. Yeah. But you want your theory to be in very large diffeomorphisms of the boundary metric too? No. Um, no, it will not be. Um, just like the chiral boson. Yes, just like the chiral boson. Yeah, good. You're, you're already um, uh, hitting upon something. Yeah. Um, so we have to supply a boundary metric to write down this term, and then we will have we will have quantities that we compute here that depend upon the geometry of, of that boundary theory. Okay. Um, so we think hard about what this um, boundary condition means for this edge mode theory. Um, it'll have important consequences, say, for the Dirac quantization on the boundary on our boundary manifold, and this is because. Um, we have a Hodge star relating the fluxes. So for instance, we can, we can continue to impose that fluxes on spatial cycles remain integer valued, but fluxes that are along thermal cycles are related through a Hodge star to a flux on a spatial cycle. But this Hodge star will then involve um, an inverse coupling constant. Well, no, sorry, will not involve an inverse coupling constant. It'll involve um, a ratio of length scales and so this, this flux will no longer be integer valued on um, partial sigma. And so we'll have fractional fluxes going along our thermal cycles. And as was uh, just mentioned, this is completely analogous to the situation for the chiral compact boson. Um, for the chiral compact boson, we can maintain its periodicity, say, going along the spatial cycle. But if we go along the thermal cycle, we pick up a ratio of length scales, and we lose that periodicity. And this is just. The, the statement that may or may not be well known that the chiral compact boson is not a true CFT in the sense that its partition function is not modular invariant. The more general statement that we have here is that these boundary theories that we'll construct have an anomalous direct quantization, anomalous of going around the thermal cycle. And so in truth, they are what we would call a relative theory. They can only exist as um, the theory on the boundary of another theory who can compensate for that anomaly. Okay, so we will call this theory a chiral mixed Maxwell. Um, it may also go by other, other names, but uh, that's what we called it in this paper. Um, and how we'll, we will write it down is we'll first take our bulk fields and we will split them into a piece that obeys the equations of motion and boundary conditions and some fluctuations that are Dirichlet. And this will allow us to split off all the bulk stuff um, and all the stuff living on the edge. And the bulk stuff, we we know how to deal with, or at least formally we know how to deal with. This guy will also be topological, um, at least in the sense relative to the boundary. Um, what that means practically is that anytime you see a uh, homology class, you replace it with a relative homology class. But what we really want to focus on here is this edge piece. Um, and the edge piece, because these guys are both obey the equations of motion and they're flat, we can separate into a harmonic piece and a pure gauge piece. And as I just mentioned, the harmonic terms here have an interesting quantization. Um, when one wraps a thermal cycle, it's fixed by a boundary condition to be in terms of the spatial cycles of the other field and vice versa. And so this theory can be written down um, as a path integral um, in the following way. We have some oscillators, which look like the regular higher form Maxwell theories that we would write down in any, any dimension. Um, secretly, these betas are tied to the alphas by our same boundary condition, by written here in a democratic way. And then we also have um, an instanton piece, but the instanton piece is not the normal instanton sum that we write down in the sense that these are only configurations living along the spatial manifold. And again, if you are not comfortable with this, you can also think about the chiral compact boson where indeed, the only thing that you will sum over is, say, the compact momentum and not, say, the winding of that boson. Okay. So we'd like to process this guy a little bit. And this oscillator partition function uh, is quite subtle. Um, there, is a gauge, there are gauge redundancies here, obviously. And then those gauge redundancies also have their own redundancy because these are higher form fields. And so it requires a complex of not only ghosts, 
but also ghosts for ghosts to compensate these lower redundancies. And this is a quite technical computation. Um, I've skipped much of the detail here. And if you want, we can talk about this later offline. But at the end of the day, if you treat this carefully with zeta function regularization, you can cast this oscillator term precisely in terms of these um, spectral eta functions. And here I've mixed the notation here, uh, beta should now be um, an inverse temperature. Uh, the instanton sum is a little bit easier to, to deal with. It's just uh, a quadratic form on some inter integral homology classes. And so these guys give Jacobi theta functions. And so we find something interesting. Um, indeed, the uh, edge mode thermal partition function takes the form of this extended character, just as it did in chiral compact boson. Okay. So taking stock of what we have, um, we were able to write down an edge mode theory for the P-form BF theory. This edge mode theory takes the form of two higher form maximal theories. And there's an interesting chirality condition that links the two. Um, this chirality con condition has uh, in interesting consequences for the instant on sum, particular it modifies it so that we only keep spatial integral homology classes. Um, and we can write down the thermal partition function in this edge mode theory. And what we find is that it takes the form of an extended representation character. And its spectrum is organized by the algebra of gauge transformations that did not die off at the boundary. And we can write that succinctly in this form here. OK, so now we're going to employ this correspondence to now explore the entanglement entropy in this system. But maybe I'll take a chance to pause and ask if there are any questions so far. Is there a combination that gives you the analog of a non-chiral boson? A left mover and a right mover? Um, at the edge of this theory, no. Um, maybe if you doubled it, no, do, like doubling, dub, doubling it in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I, I had not thought of, thought of this, but yeah, maybe if you double it, you can do this. Do this. Um, yeah, if you double and then you add the opposite chirality condition on the other side of the field, you can combine these in in a clever way. But yeah, we had not thought of that. Um, obviously, the the analog of the non chiral boson would just be P four Maxwell theory, um, two copies of it on this manifold, but. I'd, how that would arise as the boundary of, of this PF theory, I would need to think about. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So this is um, an obligatory one slide reminder of what entanglement entropy is. I, I think everyone knows this by now, but uh, we'll have it here anyways. Um, we'll consider sigma to be a spatial subregion, and we'll glue it to a complement what I'll call sigma bar along a common boundary partial sigma. And the thing that we're interested in is trace of a reduced density matrix log of that reduced density matrix, which is called the entanglement entropy. And the reduced density, ma reduced density matrix is, say, um, take, formed by taking a state and its, uh, its corresponding bra and tracing over the complementary region. It'll be useful to evaluate this guy through what's called the replica trick, which is a particular um, limit of taking moments of the reduced density matrix. Okay. As I stated here, this computation is ill-defined and you should complain for lots of good reasons. Um, for one, there's lots of UV issues in taking these traces. More modernly, people like to say now that, um, that the algorithm of operators on this space is type three and so there doesn't actually exist a trace um, here. Uh, but also there are more fundamental issues at play that come from uh, gauge invariance and in particular um, the fact that the Hilbert spaces of these gauge theories do, do not factorize even in a regulated sense into subregions. And this is due to just the non locality, the non local nature of gauge constraints acting on physical states in the system. Okay. So we're going to try to deal with both of these issues at once. And we can do so in two different flavors, um, which I'll very, very lightning speed uh, uh, describe here. Um, one is to evaluate your path integral. The, the benefit of the path integral is it sort of sweeps under the rug this non factorization issue of the gauge theory. We can just look at the gauge theory path integral. Um, and the way this works is that we'll think about replicating, uh, we'll think about taking trace row to the end as being a statement of replicating the manifold that lives on itself. And so we'll evaluate a path integral on a replicated manifold. 
Um, we can then uh, deal with the UV issues by regulating some distance epsilon away from the entangling surface here. And when we start replicating this boundary or this, this manifold and, and gluing it upon itself, if you think carefully what that geometry looks like, you realize that that manifold has a boundary which includes a thermal circle whose radius scales like n times um, this UV short distance cutoff epsilon um, times the entangling surface itself. And so now we know what to do with this guy. We evaluate this path integral. And at least the edge contribution to this, we know how to write down this edge partition function. Uh, it is a thermal edge partition function. The other method I want to describe is taking more seriously this issue of non-factorization of the gauge theory. Um, and there, what we, what we would like to do is take the uh, physical Hilbert space and embed it into a rote tensor product that we will call the extended Hilbert space. Um, because non-factorizability of the Hilbert space came from uh, the non-local nature of gauge constraints, it should come to no surprise to us that both of these Hilbert spaces contain gauge variant states. And another way of stating that is that they belong to representations of um, gauge transformations that do not die at the boundary. And so um, imposing gauge invariance on physical states uh, will end up max maximally mixing that state um, on two copies of representation, one living up for sigma, one living for sigma bar. Um, since he, both these guys are infinite dimensional, when we start taking traces, we'll run into infinities, as we know typically happens. And so we need to regulate this by, say, adding in a quadratic Hamiltonian, and we'll use the same Hamiltonian that we constructed before. And so the other way of saying this is that trace rho to the n in this extended Hilbert space picture is really taking um, a trace over a representation of e to the negative n epsilon h, which is then just an extended character here. And the bulk edge correspondence is, the equa is equating these two objects here. Okay, So these are two different ways of evaluating this entanglement entropy. So the upshot is the Rini entropy, or subsequently the entanglement entropy, is, can either be a thermal entropy associated to an infinite temperature thermal edge mode partition function, or it can be the log dimension of a representation that will regulate by taking an extended character close to the identity. Um, practically, what this means, we'll be interested in an epsilon going to zero limit of, say, uh, this ratio here. And now we can just start to process this. Um, these terms, these instantized terms, um, we can easily deal with in the epsilon going to zero limit because we have a re Poisson resummation of Jacobi theta functions. We know how they, how they behave um, under Poisson resummation. But now we want to also process these oscillator terms. And for this, we're going to need to be quite a bit stronger. And why is that? Well, in 2 plus 1D, we, the oscillator terms give us Dydekin eta functions. Dydekin eta functions have a nice modular property that we can employ to look at high temperature limit. But here, there's no obvious modular property of the spectral eta functions. In fact, we don't expect them to be modular because it, it, we're not in 2D, or not necessarily in 2D. But we also know these guys don't come from nowhere. They, they stem from summing up um, a very uh, large symmetry algebra, an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra. And so actually, it in, in, turns out there's a lot of analytic structure to these spectral eta functions that we can employ. Um, for instance, we can directly extract the high temperature behavior without having to employ any modularity to these guys um, by, say, looking at a Q expansion, inverse melon transforming that Q expansion, and then deforming the contour. This is a little bit technical, and I've left a lot of details out. Again, if you want details, you can ask me later. It's actually a nice technique that I think might be employable in other contexts. But the upshot of it is that as we look at the leading terms of this log spectral eta function, it's given by summing up residues of both the Riemann zeta function, but also the spectral zeta function of a K-form transverse Laplacian. Um, and these, these poles of this Laplacian can be analyzed by, say, looking at the heat kernel, um, which is what we do. If we stare at how epsilon appears here, in, in particular how it multiplies this energy scale, which we, we'll, we can trade in for a length scale, um, we notice that for poles sitting above zero, these will contribute positive powers of the length scale um, and contribute power laws of, of the length. 
Whereas if we have any poles sitting directly at zero, then this can give us possible log terms in um, arising from this Dedekind, or it's from, sorry, the spectral eta function. And so we'll keep, we'll have to keep track of all the terms of the spectral eta function, um, but doing so we can put together a final answer for what this entanglement entropy looks like. And what we find is the following um, form. And I'll emphasize that, that this formula holds in arbitrary dimensions, and we have not specified anything about the entanglement cut, in particular, not specified anything about its topology. Um, so we have uh, a set of terms that's, that scale with the length. The leading one is an area law. It scales like d minus 2. And then we have um, descending terms, which descend in powers of 2. OK, so these are subleading area laws. And the coefficients of these area laws are proportional to heat kernel coefficients. And we know these heat kernel coefficients can be expressed as uh, integrals of local geometric quantities, and such as the extrinsic curvature. Um, and so these guys are the local uh, divergent area laws that we would have expected in the entanglement entropy of a gap system. We have also have um, potentially an even dimension since this guy decreases in powers of two. We have a potential log term that generically will show up as long as these heat kernel coefficients are not zero. Um, and this is both a nice confirmation, but also means that in even dimensions, um, we do not have any universality to constant uh, coefficients because we can always shift epsilon to absorb these constant coefficients. However, in odd dimensions, we're in, we're in luck. In odd dimensions, we have an unambiguous universal and topological term here. Um, it's, given, it, it's given by log that k, and its coefficients are given by Betty numbers of the entangling surface. And so this is very much analogous to um, the levin wynn kataya preskill topological entanglement entropy in 2 plus 1D. Okay. So um, let me briefly recap as to what just happened here. Um, I described for you a bulk edge correspondence in a broad class of topological phases, higher dimensional topological phases that are described by uh, P form BF theories. These BF theories are indeed topological. They have a robust ground state degeneracy. And I illustrated for you the existence of an infinite dimensional uh, boundary current algebra, which are, you can think of as the inheritance of gauge transformations that do not die at the boundary. I then described for you um, the corresponding edge mode theory, which I call the chiral mix Maxwell, which is two. Uh, copies of a higher form Maxwell theory that are tied together by some chiral boundary condition. And the nice thing about this is that the spectrum of this theory is completely generated by this boundary current, current algebra. Um, this correspondence between this uh, boundary current algebra and the spectrum of this Maxwell theory gives us a lot of structure to its thermal partition function and allows us to calculate the ground state entanglement entropy directly for arbitrary cuts. We saw that we have uh, the expected area and subleading area laws whose coefficients are geometric. And we also have a constant term that is universal in, in odd dimensions, and its coefficient is, uh, is topological. It's given by Betty numbers of the entangling surface. So that's the main takeaway that I want to leave you with here. Um, I think this is a fairly nice and uh, compact story. There's still a few I would say loose ends that I would like to um, look at and, and tie up. Um, one is that I really talked about here entanglement coming from edge degrees of freedom, but and I really did not uh, think much about what happens to say the bulk piece of this um, of this BF theory. And so you might ask, does this contribute to any bulk entanglement? And I think it does. Um, and this is I think most succinctly stated in this extended Hilbert space story, where our extended Hilbert space was constructed from representation of uh, representations of variational charges, but there are also charges that are not expressed variationally. These are large gauge transformations that sit inside the bulk of a subregion. And these guys are in fact indeed generated by these surface operators where now sigma or sigma and eta are homology cycles that sit within either subregion or its complement. And we need to also endow our states with um, eigenvalues with some maximally commuting set of these guys, which we can do, and then ask, what is this constraints on physical states for the system? 
And what we realize is that physical state should be maximally correlated over eigenvalues of surface operators when either those surface operators can pull back to um, something non-zero on the boundary of, of our system while also remaining non-trivial in the full uh, glued together system. If, if say it can pull to zero on sigma bar, then it should be set to one on, on the physical state. But anything that can be non-trivial on, on the glued guy together um, should be maximally correlated here. Actually counting these guys is, is more subtle than you might think. And it, it took us uh, quite a bit. Um, we did count these in a previous paper and the answer is given by this uh, maybe nice, maybe not so nice formula, depending on who you ask. Um, you have an alternating sum of things topological to the entangling surface itself, but you also have some bulk dependent pieces here. Um, and these bulk dependent pieces have to be there because as I said, we, we, we want cycles that can be trivial either in one subregion or another subregion to not actually act on a state. Um, we told this guy in this paper, the essential topological entanglement. And I, I think it's very natural to suspect that this guy is indeed giving the bulk entanglement of this theory. Um, it would be nice to confirm this with say some other computational methods. One such method is uh, surgery, which um, is very well employed in three dimensions. Um, and surgery basically allows us to take a uh, path integral on any arbitrary topology and cut it down into nice little pieces. And so we only need to know, say, path integral on some simple ingredient topologies. Um, in 3D, this follows from noting that the path integral on any manifold whose boundaries S2 is proportional to the state um, on doing the path integral on the three ball. And so uh, if we glue together two things along an S2, we can insert a three ball state for free as long as we normalize it. And this allows us to basically surgery this along this S2 and divide by CS3. Um, so we'd like to develop something like this in higher dimensions to give us another computational tool. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more involved. The topology in higher dimensions is more involved, but also we have more ingredients because there are potentially more choices for compact manifolds that have a dimension of filament space equal to one that we can insert here. And so it's, uh, we're not quite sure how much this will buy us um, in developing a, a surgery method here. But it'd be nice to develop um, because then it would give us an alternate approach for, say, evaluating replica path integrals without having to use, say, hard wall regulators. Um, there's a complication to this and that such that when we remove these higher wall regulators, we're really looking at what are called branch covers over an entangling surface. And these branch covers typically have what are called analytic torsion. So we need to use a more formal version of BF theory that we have not employed here. But we consider this just mostly be a technical complication. Okay, so with that, I will um, thank you for your attention and I will also open up to questions. Yeah. Did I correctly understand that you're saying the boundary of BF theory has to be described by some theory that's chiral in some sense? Could yes, you know? um, that's right. It It's chiral in the sense that it relates, um, it, well, it's not truly chiral. It's uh, it's chiral in, say, some special dimensions, dimensions that are the form 2p plus 1. So, for instance, 3D, when p is a one form, this can be a truly chiral boundary condition. We call it a chiral light boundary condition because it assumes that form in these special dimensions. But it is indeed um, a boundary condition that mixes um, cycles of of one field with cycles of another field. Um, I mean, you see what that, yeah, it's this, this boundary condition here. Okay, so apart from the two plus the, those special, so those are, those are special dimensions where you identify B and F in some way. Yeah, that's right. right. In other dimensions, your system is presumably time reversal invariant. Right. Your boundary is time reversal invariant. Yes. No chirality. Yeah, no, that's, that's I, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm being a little bit loose with my nomenclature, and yeah, indeed, I we we would like to we would like to call these chiral, but um, chirality really only makes sense in, in those special dimensions. Thank you. 
Thank you.